Welcome back to our news bulletin. We start from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who says the Kartarpur Corridor is a practical example of Pakistan's desire for peace. After his visit to the corridor, Guterres tweeted, The initiative is a symbol of interfaith harmony. The corridor provides pilgrims a visa-free link between Darbar Sahib in Narawal and the Dera Baba Nanak Shrine in Indian Punjab. Speaking in Lahore earlier, Guterres said globalization is leading to global inequality, which has triggered widespread unrest. Warning against the negative impacts of climate change, he said countries lack the political will to tackle the issue. Meanwhile, Guterres also visited a primary school where he launched an anti-polio campaign by administering a vaccination. Pakistan has successfully conducted the flight test of its air-launched cruise missile, RAD-2. The Pakistan military says RAD-2 has a range of 600 kilometers and significantly enhances air-delivered strategic standoff capability on land and sea. It said the weapon system is equipped with state-of-the-art guidance and navigation systems, ensuring engagement of targets with high precision. The successful flight test was witnessed by the Pakistan military's top brass. The President and Prime Minister of Pakistan have congratulated scientists and engineers involved in the project on the successful test. Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi reiterates that Kashmir is an international issue and India cannot impose its illegal unilateral decisions there. Speaking at the concluding session of the two-day International Refugee Summit in Islamabad, Qureshi said India's reaction to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres' offer to mediate on Kashmir shows it is avoiding resolving the dispute. Our correspondent Sumaira Khan has more in this report from Islamabad. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said the conference's participants commended Pakistan's hospitality and inclusive policies for Afghan refugees. The conference recognized and highly appreciated Pakistan's generosity and progressive policies that have enabled millions of Afghan refugees and nationals to accept refuge, health, education, livelihoods and social mobility without discrimination for over four decades. He highlighted that an Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process is a prerequisite for the refugees' repatriation. Participants highlighted that to enable sustainable return and reintegration, a prerequisite would be a comprehensive Afghan-owned and Afghan-led process, peace process and urgent investments in the priority areas of return and reintegration in Afghanistan. Pakistan's UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador Mahira Khan spoke in favor of a humanitarian approach to handling refugees. It is really the truth, it's factual. Pakistan has just been such an amazing host country for over 40 years. I think Pakistan needs to understand that about themselves. Pakistanis need to know that they've done, it's a huge thing to be able to open your arms and say, you know, come in. And for 40 years, yes, four decades, it's not easy. It isn't easy for host countries either. The conference was attended by over 500 participants. This included Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, high-ranking UN officials and the second Vice President of Afghanistan. Reporting for Indus News, Sumaira Khan, Islamabad. Moving on, India has now imposed further curbs in occupied Kashmir by invoking the Unlawful Activities Act. The act gags all dissenting voices online giving New Delhi the power to jail any social media user for up to five years. New Delhi has started filing FIRs against Kashmiri civilians using proxy servers to evade the internet ban. Indian troops claim miscreants are propagating rumors regarding the current security scenario in the valley. The FIR came after a video of ailing Hurriyat leader Saeed Al Gilani was uploaded on social media. New Delhi has imposed a total clampdown and communications blackout in the valley for the last 198 days. Also in India, Telangana has become the latest state to pass a resolution against the controversial Citizenship Amendment Act. 
Earlier, four other states, Kerala, Punjab, Rajasthan and West Bengal, passed similar resolutions. The state has appealed to the centre not to discriminate on the basis of religion in granting citizenship to anyone. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of Indians held a rally against the law in Punjab. The protesters accused the central government of carrying out a communal agenda of targeting the country's Muslims. The all-women sit-in also continues in capital Delhi's Shaheen Bagh, despite pressure by the police and the BJP government. In Afghanistan, Interior Minister Masood Androbi says the U.S. Taliban violence reduction deal will take effect within the next five days. Speaking in Kabul, he said Afghan security forces will retaliate firmly if the Taliban continue their attacks during this period. Earlier, Taliban spokesperson Sohail Shaheen said a peace agreement has been reached with the U.S. and will be signed before the end of February. He said all foreign troops will leave the country and some 5,000 Taliban prisoners will be released under the agreement. Meanwhile, the Election Commission has declared President Ashraf Ghani the winner of the 2019 presidential polls. The results were delayed for nearly five months after allegations of vote rigging from Ghani's main rival, Abdullah Abdullah. The UN has accused the Syrian government and its ally Russia of deliberately targeting civilians in northwestern Syria. In a statement, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet said 300 people have been killed in government attacks this year. She said 93% of the deaths were caused by Syrian and Russian forces. According to the UN, nearly 900,000 people have fled violence in the region since December. Bachelet said this is the largest exodus of civilians since World War II. This comes as President Bashar al-Assad vows to continue fighting against rebels despite major gains in Aleppo. We've recorded the deaths of 299 civilians in this region of Syria. Around 93% of those deaths were caused by the Syrian government and its allies. In addition, 10 medical facilities and 19 educational facilities have either been directly hit or affected by strikes close by. Daily airstrikes and bombs in Syria have pushed parents to come up with a new way to help their children cope with the fighting sounds of war. The report will tell you how a Syrian father in Aleppo is helping his daughter to face her fear with laughter. To protect his daughter Salva from the psychological scars left on countless Syrian children, Abdullah Muhammad is using humor to take the horror out of the sound of war. <laughs> <laughs> now, when a bomb falls in their province, Muhammad and his three-year-old laugh and pretend the noise is a firework or a toy gun. Muhammad says his daughter is a child who does not understand war. The dejected father has taken the unusual approach after he and his family were forced to flee their home in Idlib. The UN says 900,000 Syrians have been displaced since the start of December in the harsh cold temperatures. The offensive that escalated late last year has caused the biggest single single displacement of people since the conflict began in 2011. The war has killed over 380,000 people since it began almost nine years ago. The EU has expanded its sanctions against the Syrian government by adding eight more businessmen and two entities on the sanctions list. EU Council says President Bashar al-Assad's government directly benefits from the activities of these people. The Council said its sanctions against the regime includes oil embargoes, restrictions on certain investments and freezing the Syrian central bank's assets in the EU. To date, the EU has added 277 businessmen and 71 entities to its sanctions list, imposing a travel ban and freezing their assets. It said the bloc has also imposed export restrictions on equipment and technology that might be used for internal repression. The EU has been implementing sanctions on Syria since 2011 and revises its decision in this field on an annual basis. The United Nations Libya and Osman Salami says the seaport in the capital Tripoli has been attacked. The incident is the latest clash in a battle to control the country's internationally recognized government. 
Tripoli e seaport has remained open for food and other imports since Khalifa Haftar started a campaign to take the city in April last year. Salami spoke as officials from Tripoli forces and LNA met for a second round of talks in Geneva to establish a permanent truce. He said both sides have again refused to sit in the same room. Meanwhile, the United Nations has welcomed a new EU naval operation to enforce the arms embargo in Libya. On Monday, EU foreign ministers agreed to authorize a naval mission to stop weapons shipments into the North African state. Four militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party have been killed in Turkish airstrikes during a counter-terrorist operation in northern Iraq. In a statement, Turkey's National Defense Ministry said military operations backed by air power were carried out in the Hakkork and Avacin regions. The Turkey Ministry said Turkey will continue to destroy weapon caches and shelters used by the terrorists. It said over 400 Kurdish militants have been killed in northern Iraq over the past five months. Turkey holds the PKK responsible for killing around 40,000 people over a 30-year terror campaign. We have a lot more coming up right after this short break, so stay tuned. Welcome back. 93 more people have died in the last 24 hours from the outbreak of the new coronavirus in China, bringing the death toll to 1,868. The National Health Commission says another 1,886 infections have been confirmed, bringing the death toll to over 72,400. Details in this report. While Beijing is fighting the outbreak of new coronavirus, it is struggling to contain the epidemic. Medical staff and supplies from across China have flooded Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak. We are required to deliver 6,000 N95 respirators, but we managed to make it to 10,000. And instead of providing 60,000 surgical masks as required, we managed to provide 100,000 of them. The workers fighting on the front lines are risking their lives in this battle against the virus. So it is our duty to ensure there is enough support materials for them. The World Health Organization says the virus is a serious problem, but is warning against overreaction and falling into hysteria. This is a very serious outbreak and it has the potential to grow. But uh, we, need to, we need to balance that in terms of the number of people infected. Outside Hubei, uh, this, this epidemic uh, is, is, is affecting a very tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of people. Japan now has over 500 coronavirus cases, including 455 on a quarantined cruise ship docked at Yokohama. In China, the annual parliamentary meeting, scheduled for early March, has been put off because of the outbreak. The new coronavirus has taken a toll on China's economy after Beijing quarantined its most densely populated provinces. Major companies stopped operations in mainland China, denting production and causing the stock market to plunge. More in this report. Beijing was quick to predict the economic fallout of the outbreak when it injected billions of dollars into the financial system. While the impetus provided some cushion, it was not enough to prevent nosediving stocks and uncertain markets. But Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs King Gong believes the subdued demand will be released rapidly and the economy will rebound. The impact of the epidemic on the Chinese economy will be short term and temporary. Provinces and the municipalities in China, except for Hubei, are gradually resuming production. Government departments have introduced solid measures, including tax and fee cuts. Apple has announced it will miss its revenue guidance for the March quarter, affecting both production and Chinese demand. The annual Mobile World Congress was also cancelled with a mass exodus by exhibitors over their fears for the outbreak. But organizations such as L'Oreal and Toyota Boshoku have reopened their Chinese plants and research and development centers. 
Our research and development center resumed operation on February 10th, according to a unified schedule, on the same day when all L'Oreal workshops started to operate except the Yichang plant and the Wuhan office. Many global corporate giants say they are confident of Chinese market because the government has taken effective measures to contain the epidemic. Japan's health ministry says 88 more people from the quarantine cruise ship have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. This brings the dead toll number of confirmed cases to 542. In a statement, the government spokesperson said over 3,000 passengers are still on the ship and about half of them are Japanese. He said, Japan plans to start trials of HIV medications to treat coronavirus patients as a surge in cases poses a threat to the economy and public health. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson spoke to Chinese President Xi Jinping and expressed his sympathies for those hit by the outbreak. President Xi thanked the UK for its support and the donation of medical equipment. Australia, Canada, Italy and South Korea are planning to evacuate citizens from the ship using a chartered plane. Ten people have been killed in a militant attack in the eastern Beni region of Congo. The local government says the casualties include eight civilians and two security personnel. Beni officials said hundreds have died in militia violence since November last year. They blame the Allied Democratic Forces for the attack. The ADF is accused of killing thousands of civilians over the last five years. In Ukraine, a soldier has been killed and four others injured after heavy fighting erupted in the country's eastern Donbass region. The country's military accused Russian-backed separatists of using weapons banned under a ceasefire agreement. They said four rebel soldiers were killed and six injured in the exchange of fire. President Volodymyr Zelensky said rebels' provocation would not derail Kiev's course to achieve peace. The conflict in Donbass erupted after Russia annexed Ukraine's southern Crimea Peninsula in March 2014. Since then, over 13,000 people have died in the conflict. Over 26,000 people have taken part in early voting before Saturday's Nevada Democratic Caucus. The Nevada Democratic Party says more than half of the voters on the first day were first-time caucus goers. This is the third stage of the race to find a challenger to U.S. President Donald Trump in November's presidential election. More in this report. The eight-way Democratic race is heating up as it enters a crucial period before the approaching Super Tuesday on March 3rd. Ex-New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg will formally join the race on Saturday after sitting out the early Iowa and New Hampshire contests. Leading candidate Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders took an early swing at the billionaire Bloomberg. Today we say to those billionaires, who are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to support candidates who represent the rich and the powerful. Today we say to Mayor Bloomberg, we are a democracy, not an oligarchy. You're not gonna buy this election. Nevada is the first state with a diverse population after the predominantly white states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Nearly one-third of voters in the state's Democratic caucus in 2016 were either black or Latino. Former Vice President Joe Biden has pinned his hopes on the diverse demographics of the state after poor showing in Iowa and New Hampshire. I am the candidate who has the broadest support from all sectors of the economy. For example, I have had, historically, overwhelming support from the African-American community. I mean, 75 percent favorable rating type support, because I, come out of, because I come out of the civil rights movement. Sanders leads the early polls in Nevada at 25 percent, while Joe Biden is second on 18 percent. The ex-Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg is languishing at a lowly 14 percent, behind Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren on 15 percent. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is no longer being held in solitary confinement 
and his health is improving. Speaking in London, his spokesperson Christian Raffinson said the state of his health is better after the pressure from his legal team and the public. Assange is in London prison fighting an extradition request from the United States. Assange's father John Shipton said his long confinement indoors had damaged his health. The WikiLeaks founder is facing 18 charges in the U.S., including conspiring to hack government computers and violating an espionage law. He could spend decades in prison if convicted. Assange made headlines in early 2010 when WikiLeaks published a classified U.S. military video showing a 2007 attack by Apache helicopters in Baghdad that killed a dozen people. France's parliament has begun debating the government's draft bill on pension reforms. The proposed reforms have been dragged by months of nationwide protests and strikes that have brought the country to a halt. More in this report. When President Emmanuel Macron's plan for a single points-based pension system were published, the country responded with outrage. Public transport workers walked out for six weeks in December and January, causing travel misery for millions. Paris offered concessions including the temporary removal of the rise in pension age to 64, the most contested measure. The government invited trade unionists to find another way to balance the pension deficit during a financial conference earlier this month. The government has three ambitions. Build a universal pension system that ensures every French citizen in which everyone should be insured regardless of their career path or position. Consider life experiences by putting our sights away from status and into activity. And finally, this system should mobilize new tools, such as prevention or the right to a career change for the most difficult professions. The bill is now being discussed in Parliament with opposition MPs hoping to derail it by tabling a record 41,000 amendments. The opposition benches call the bill monstrous and want to see it shelved. Ce projet, uh, est monstrueux. This bill is monstrous and you are losing control of the monster. You now have the salutary possibility and not only the possibility but the power and without a doubt the duty to end this nightmare to this ordeal, to this grave mistake. With the final vote before the summer and the bill under parliamentary discussion, trade unions are continuing their strikes in Paris. They have called for nationwide protests on February 20th. We're taking a short break, stay with us. Welcome back to our news bulletin. The EU has warned big tech companies could face tougher rules and penalties if they fail to curb hate speech and disinformation. EU Commissioner Thierry Breton says the bloc will take matters into its own hands if platforms do not respect rules. Breton said new conditions can be binding to avoid online abuse since illegal content is massively disseminated to European citizens. The EU's Executive Vice President Marguerite Vestager is expected to announce a single EU data market to curb the dominance of tech giants. The European Union introduced the General Data Protection Regulation in 2018 to give people more control over privacy settings. Under the GDPR, regulators can fine companies up to 20 million euros for any breaches. The UN says the international community must help African countries affected by destructive swarms of locusts. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization says the crisis threatens the food supply of 13 million people in East Africa. The biggest locust swarms are in the Horn of Africa, where Somalia was the first country to declare an emergency over the infestation. The UNFAO has asked for $76 million to help tackle the disaster. An even bigger locust invasion is forecast for this June. This is a crucial time of year for farmers across Africa. A swarm of desert locusts can contain about 40 million insects per square kilometer, which can eat the same amount of food as about 35,000 people in one day. Pakistan also declared an emergency over a locust infestation along its border with India earlier this month. Snow-capped peaks used to be clearly visible from the streets of Almaty and Bishkek, two of the largest cities in Central Asia. But now a heavy cloud of dark smog often blots out the view, as air pollution regularly reaches levels similar to New Delhi and Lahore. Details in this report. 
In the Kyrgyz capital, Bishkek, a city of one million people, the onset of winter means a surge in pollution. People burn coal and other dirty fuels in stoves to heat their homes. Here, readings of PM2.5, a measure of fine particles in the air, frequently reach levels the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency defines as hazardous to human health. The sensor in my house showed that the excess is not three times the norm which is usually the case in other post-Soviet cities, but seven to eight times the norm. Sometimes it reaches ten times when everyone is warming their homes on cold days. Almaty, Kazakhstan's largest city, runs on coal-fired power stations dating back to the Soviet era. But other factors have created a massive increase in the smog problem in the last 20 years. It is a common fact that air quality in Almaty is quite poor, especially in the winter. We are located in a mountainous area and the ventilation is poor. Besides, there are too many vehicles. However, I think the main reason for pollution is power stations that burn coal and haven't switched to renewable energy sources. Smog is a problem in the capitals of other ex-Soviet republics, such as Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Despite pressure from their people, governments have been slow to acknowledge and act on the problem. Biohacking is a global movement whose followers want to upgrade their bodies with experimental technology and DIY help. In Russia, the trend is spreading, with some people adding chips to their hands to open doors or start cars. Others hope they can live longer through intensive monitoring of their bodies. This report has details. Euros and a small cut through the skin is the price one pays to join the growing community of biohackers. Young programmer Alexei is having a subdermal chip implanted so he can gain access to his office with a wave of his hand. He's part of a growing number of people upgrading the human body through technology, intense medical tests or extreme exercise. For him, implanting technology under his skin is the next stage of human evolution. It's something I decided to do a long time ago, mainly because it's convenient. Not to get rid of all cards, but at least to carry around less of them. IT specialist Vladislav Zaitsev has performed over 50 procedures in his small studio apartment. Implanting a chip in your hand is a rather radical form of biohacking, a global movement aimed at using technology to upgrade the human body. This lifestyle is growing popular among Russians. In biohacking, I like things that give a real, confirmed effect. I like the idea of expanding the capabilities of the human body. Other biohackers are even more ambitious. At a private clinic, entrepreneur Stanislav Skakun sits as nurses fill some 20 test tubes with his blood for analysis. If we start dying not from illnesses but from accidents, we would on average live 5,000 years. That suits me, as it's much better than 90 years, so I'm ready to die from an accident and not cancer or cardiovascular diseases. There are no official statistics, but according to local biohackers, around 1,000 Russians are currently chipped. They're part of a growing number of DIY biologists opening the door to the future of transhumanism, the belief that humans can live beyond their physical and mental limitations. In Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, the region's distinct traditional music is being revived as the country makes a swift recovery from years of terrorism. Local people's interest in instruments like the Tawang and the Rabab is returning, and young people are also putting their own bands together. More in this report. <laughs> In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, centuries-old traditional music is in vogue again. Local people's interest in instruments like the tawang and the rabab is returning. Young people are also putting their own bands together and ancient tribal traditions are staging a comeback. Now the situation is good, very good. We can play anywhere, whenever people invite us. Shops selling musical instruments are also thriving. Pashtun pop singers are also gaining popularity among youngsters. Music is the spice of life, a part of our culture. What is culture? Culture means those means satisfying the heart and mind. 
There is difference between the culture and civilization. But the difference is a nuisance, a bit which can't be differentiated. So it is a part of our culture, an integral part of our culture. The emerging singers are also spreading local melodies abroad. Pashtun music is characterized by the rabab, a stringed instrument played to the beat of drums. This is Pakhtun's culture. They enjoy it and play it in their gatherings. People play mange, rabab and feel happy. We make these rabobs and it is known as the king of all musical instruments. The rabab and tawang are deeply popular among ethnic Pashtuns. Pashtun music is also highly popular in Afghanistan, which has also produced many traditional musicians. French Riviera city of Nice has kicked off its annual King's Carnival for the 136th time with fashion as its main theme. The floats, big heads and flower battles have attracted hundreds of thousands of spectators from around the globe. Watch more in this report. Nice's streets have been filled with crowds of happy carnival goers showered with confetti. They're here to see the parade's showpiece floats, each carrying giant effigies. This year's event is centered around fashion. The carnival paid tribute to legends of the trade like Jean-Paul Gaultier, Sonia Riquel and Karl Lagerfeld. Last year, the festival attracted over 200,000 spectators. This year, organizers expect an even bigger crowd. We come every year. Yes, yes, it's beautiful, very beautiful. All the floats and everything is really well done. Really very beautiful. It's magnificent. We got dressed up to take part in the Nice Carnival. The event runs until February 29th and has been a fixture of the coastal city for almost 150 years. In Britain, the fashion house Burberry has showcased its 2020 winter collection at London Fashion Week in a show called Memories. The house exhibited its signature neutral drones with references to old-style English tailoring. Have a look at this report. Models from the US and Russia wore iconic Burberry trench coats paired with lengthened silhouettes. The Hadid sisters, Irina Sheikh, and Kendall Jenner showed reinventions of the iconic trench coat with variations on tartan prints. Burberry's winter collection has come in different sizes, colors, and presentations of the brand's classic check. The design focuses on a futuristic chic aesthetic, but with subtle nods to the British fashion imagery. Like other European fashion houses, Burberry has been hit hard by the coronavirus outbreak in China, its most important and a growing market. British investment bank HSBC has announced it's cutting around 35,000 jobs following a drop in 2019 profits by about a third. Headquartered in the UK, the bank employs over 40,000 people in Britain. In a statement, the bank's interim chief executive Noel Quinn said HSBC holdings would shed $100 billion in assets. He said the company is revamping its US and European businesses in a drastic overhaul. Quinn said the fall in profits was due to over $7 billion in write-offs regarding its banking operations in Europe. 
The bank currently operates in over 50 countries across North America, Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Japan's cabinet has approved a bill to support local companies to develop a secure 5G network. This follows growing alarm among policymakers over the increasing influence of China's 5G technology. The bill gives access to low interest rate loans from government affiliated financial institutions to local companies. The bill also gives tax incentives to companies adopting 5G technologies if they meet standards set by the government. The government will submit the bill to the parliament and aims to bring it to effect around summer. The US has been campaigning against Huawei on allegations the telecom giant could spy on customers for Beijing. Wall Street stocks have fallen at the open, falling a drop in the shares of US technology giant Apple. A surprise sales warning from the iPhone maker fanned worries about the impact of the coronavirus outbreak on global supply chains. Apple cautioned it does not expect to meet its quarterly revenue forecast, citing slowed production and sluggish demand in China. The indexes of S&P 500, Nasdaq Composite and Dow Jones Industrial Average are trading fractionally lower. Meanwhile, oil prices dropped sharply over the spread of fears about the world economy, while the dollar mostly gained. Now let's look at the weather from around the globe. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.